Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Thank you for staying with us for the last lecture of the afternoon. Uh, my name is Mary Kelly Quinn. I'm from University College Dublin. And I'm going to speak about a topic that's very different from, I think, a lot of the previous uh, talks. So I'm going to talk about Ireland's rivers and their biodiversity and highlight a few concerns that I have. So I'm going to start off by reminding us of the importance of fresh waters. And I'll say a few words about what the 21st century brings to our fresh waters. Then I'll give you a brief overview of Ireland's wonderful freshwater resources, their amazing freshwater life, and I'm going to focus on rivers and look, about, look at how Ireland's rivers are faring. The information that I'm presenting comes from three publication sources. The first is a book on Ireland's rivers, which I co-edited with Julian Reynolds in 2020, and that is the collective knowledge of 38 contributors, freshwater ecologists across Ireland. And I'm very grateful that the Royal Irish Academy provided some wonderful old historic images which we have incorporated into that book. The second source is a publication that I co-authored with Catherine Bradley and Hugh Feely, and it was on freshwater biodiversity in Ireland's uh, rivers and lakes, and that it is now a time to take stock of what we know, what we don't know, and what we should be concerned about. The third source of information is a series of EPA reports on water quality, and I'll acknowledge those as I move forward. Okay, so fresh water, why is it so important? Well, it has been described as the lifeblood of human civilization. It's carried in the capillaries, which are the streams, and the veins, which are the rivers, of the Earth's circulatory system. And just like our own circulatory system, we have to try and maintain the health of that circulatory system for our own benefit, if nothing else. So in fact, even though fresh waters cover only 1% of the Earth's surface, they provide a disproportionately high level of goods and services, which we call ecosystem services. So that's everything from clean water for drinking purposes, domestic use, industrial use, and so on, right through to cultural services, recreational value. And what's important is all of those goods and benefits are underpinned by the biodiversity of freshwater systems. Sorry, this thing is on a timer. Is it possible to take it off the timer? No? Okay. Um, so globally, freshwater support at least 10% of all known species. And at the same time, freshwater is among the most threatened ecosystems on our planet. They've been heavily polluted, Rivers, for example, have been drained, straightened, placed in straitjackets, and buried. And consequently, fresh waters have experienced a lot of biodiversity loss. In fact, at a higher rate, at least what has been published is that that loss is at a higher rate than on land or at sea. And because it's largely out of sight and therefore out of mind, it has been described as an invisible tragedy hidden beneath the water surfaces. So it's against that background that I move on to have a quick look at Ireland's uh, freshwater resources. So we are wonderful freshwater resources. We have 84,000 kilometers of rivers, but 75% of that river network is what we call small streams or headwaters. So these are streams no more than two meters in width, yet they're extremely important, not only in the capture of water, but as for their biodiversity. And they're also extremely vulnerable to pollution and have an effect on water quality for their downstream. We have 12,200 lakes. They cover about 2% of the land surface of the area. So that's twice the European average. And the majority of those are also small. So about 8,000 of them are less than one hectare 
in area, and the majority of them are actually quite shallow. So an important message I think we have to get out there is that fresh waters, and rivers in this case I want to dwell on, are living systems with a rich biodiversity above water and underneath the surface. So above water, we have these iconic species. Kingfisher, one of three uh, species which are dependent on rivers. Otters, and then a range of insects, the damselflies and, dam and dragonflies, beautiful insects. Underneath the surface, we're all familiar with fish. Uh, trout and salmon are particularly important as hallmarks of good water quality. But there are smaller creatures known as macroinvertebrates. And in Ireland, we have about 2,500. I say we have about because, in fact, we don't have a complete checklist of all the species, freshwater species that occur in our rivers. And we don't have a complete knowledge of their distribution. So here we're talking about everything from mites to mayflies, from the beautiful to the absolute amazing. These are two special invertebrates, and I don't have time to show you many, but I just want to give you a glimpse into this wonderful diversity of species that we have. And the first is the freshwater crayfish, and it, together with, um, together with the pearl mussel, are threatened species across their distributional range. The pearl mussel is particularly sensitive and will only occur and reproduce in the most pristine of surface waters. And this is a species that can live for 120 years. And in Ireland, many of the pearl mussel populations are dominated by senior citizens. They are no longer producing uh, the juveniles. But there are smaller creatures that are just as fascinating. And I've been studying fresh waters for over 30 years. And I, every time I look at a sample on a river bank from a clean river, I'm absolutely amazed at the variety and the beauty and the abundance of these creatures. And what I've shown you here on the slide are probably the most abundant of those, the mayflies, the stoneflies, and the caddisflies. And these are the juvenile insects. They will emerge from water for a small period of time, but they spend most of their life under water. And these are very important indicators of water quality that I will mention in just a moment. But there are other creatures. The non-debiting midges are the most species rich of all of these invertebrates, 542 species. So nearly 20% of all the invertebrate species that occur in rivers are these midge larvae. And then you have the other creatures that I've just shown you on the slide there. And that's only a small snapshot of the variety that occurs in fresh waters. And these have a functional role in maintaining good water quality. So microinvertebrates, as I just mentioned, can be indicators of water quality. So in effect, they are acting like the canary in the river. And I'll show you two images here. On the left-hand side is a sample taken from a clean river, and you can see a variety of insects there. There's mayflies, particularly the flattened mayfly. There are stoneflies. There are caddisflies. And on the right, is a sample taken from a polluted river, and you see the absence of those pollution-sensitive species. And that absence, in effect, represents species loss, biodiversity loss. So the EPA used these indicators to assign ecological water quality. And this is a map taken from one of their recent reports. And the ecological quality is rated from high down to bad. So this is according to the Water Framework Directive. And there's just two striking things that I want to draw your attention to. The first is how little blue lines or how few blue lines are on that map. In other words, how few high status unpolluted river systems we have. And the second then is all the yellows and the brown they represent impacted waters. The green represent just good status, so reasonably good. So when you put all of that information together, in effect, 
43% of the river sites that are monitored by the EPA are in unsatisfactory condition and failing to meet the requirements of the Water Framework Directive and impacting on the goods and the services that we depend on from river systems. A lot of this is due to nutrient pollution and there is evidence of increasing nutrient pollution even today in many of these rivers. Another problem is sediment. And this is coming from erosion of banks or runoff from arable fields. And it's described as a master stressor because it can have immediate and prolonged negative effects on freshwater biodiversity. The good news is that it can be easily mitigated and it definitely represents the low hanging fruit in terms of water quality protection. So the significant pressures on Ireland's rivers and indeed lakes come from a number of sources. The top guns are agriculture, urban wastewater or inadequate wastewater treatment, and then what is called hydromorphology, which represents physical damage to habitats, say from drainage, straightening rivers, etc. Now, I think it is shocking to realize that today, raw sewage is being discharged into, I think, 34, from 34 villages and towns across the country. This is unacceptable in a developed country and generally goes unnoticed. Agriculture is mainly responsible for diffuse pollution and it is much more difficult to tackle. It's easy enough to tackle with political will and a little bit of money to address the wastewater treatment problems. But diffuse pollution from agriculture is having a negative effect. It is eliminating biodiversity in some areas. All of those pollution sensitive invertebrates that I mentioned are not found in areas with intensive agriculture. And the other issue that we're seeing in areas with intensive agriculture is that the variety that you get across the landscape is much reduced in these areas. So the invertebrate communities in these areas are becoming much more similar, despite the region covering a geological diversity of landscapes. And this is one of the graphs that comes from that paper uh, in biology and environment that I mentioned earlier on. But I think what is even more shocking and which a lot of people don't realize is the loss of our best water quality, our best river sites. These are the near pristine sites. And in the 1980s, the EPA monitored over 500 of these sites. And in the period, in their monitoring period, 2016 to 2018, those were reduced to just 22. Over the last two years, the numbers have crept up to something like, I think, about 38. But that's far from what was present in the 1980s. And this represents loss of our natural heritage. Equally important, what it is, is loss of natural pools of species or reservoirs of species that could repopulate areas where pollution pressure has been removed. So we may see very slow recovery of river systems when, as I said, pollution pressures have been removed. So there's no doubt that invertebrates, uh, freshwater invertebrates in this country are under pressure. And I have a table here that I'm also taking from that publication, the biology and environment publication that I just mentioned a few minutes ago. And what it does here, it summarizes a conservation assess status assessment that has been carried out by various authors on five groups of freshwater invertebrates. And 
So this is following the IUCN classification from le those of least concern, the LC, but what I want you to look at are the, those figures from the VU, which is the vulnerable, up to the uh, endangered or extinct. And across all of these five groups, almost 30% are vulnerable or in worse condition. Furthermore, most of these assessments were carried out over 10 years ago and on data which was much older than that. I have no doubt that the situation is a lot worse today, but we don't have the data at present to make that assessment. So in effect, we are not aware of what we are losing. So to sum up, I think the time is now for action. Water quality is going in the wrong direction, despite considerable effort. We have the science. We know where the problems are. It's just a matter of finding the best solutions to those problems. The Lo Local Authority Waters Programme, the Law Pro, are doing a fantastic job working with communities to identify the problems and find locally adapted solutions or relevant local solutions to, to address pollution problems. But it's slow. And I wonder whether it is going to be fast enough to stem the decline in water quality, which will have implications for all of us. So I think the first step is generation of awareness. And awareness is increasing, and this is why I picked this uh, topic today. But the bigger challenge is to bridge the gap between awareness and action. And I think this is where we need to get the message to our policymakers and those in, in practice so that we can accelerate the efforts to stem the decline in water quality. But in effect, we all have a role. So we all need to do our, our bit. We need to think about how our behaviors and how our daily life can interfere with water. So we need to avoid piping foul water into rivers, minimize the use of pesticides and herbicides, you know, have septic tanks if you're on that sort of system checked uh, regularly, cleaned regularly, protect riverbank vegetation, that'll minimize diffuse pollution entering rivers. It'll also uh, uh, reduce the level of sediment pollution. And finally, Join citizen science. Join communities that are beginning to recognize these problems, try and, and find out where the problems are coming from and what needs to be, to be done. And there's quite a lot of citizen science activities uh, around the country. So thank you for your attention. I'm just going to leave you with a quotation. Um, from the uh, Living Planet report. And I think it, it sums up my conclusion here is that really the time for action is now, but it does require governments, businesses, and citizens to rethink how we produce, consume, measure success, and value the natural environment, in particular, freshwater environments. Thank you.